Can we use AI in a practical use case? Hey, why not look at astrophysics? Whenever we are looking out in the space, we want to find how planets form, or we want to discover new planets outside of our solar system in our galaxy. Today, we use artificial intelligence to go through all our recorded data and find new planets. As you see here, we have a star, a young star has been born just some million years ago, and we have here a protoplanetary disk circling around the star, full of gas and a lot of dust. And you see here, there is a young planet forming here, circling around this beautiful new star. And this is exactly what we're going to look at, how we use AI for this particular reason, astrophysics. But talking about astrophysics, we have to know a little bit of a background. So exactly 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang happened. And right after the Big Bang, and I mean really in the trillionth second after the Big Bang, we have something that we call cosmological inflation. Now, it's an inflaton field, a scalar field, more or less just rolling down its potential, and its energy is converted in a process what we call reheating to form matter and radiation that we know today. Either if you go with a single field inflaton or a mathematical, a little bit more elaborated multi field inflaton theory, it has to serve one purpose. And it was invented by Elm Gutt in 1981 for one reason and one reason only. We could not find any magnetic monopoles in the universe. And there was the problem of flatness if we look at the cosmic microwave radiation. So, in order to have a model that takes care of what we see today, Alan Gutt invented the inflation theory. So just to make sure we cannot derive it from first theoretical principle in physics, we just have to invent it so that what we see and what we calculate, that they both fit. Beautiful. Yeah, about 10 microseconds or so, a little bit more or less, after the Big Bang, we had a universe that was really hot, it was really dense, and a phase transition happened, and in which the quarks and the gluon became now confined within hadrons, which we call today proton and neutrons. And this whole process here is known as hadronization. And then about three minutes later, the temperature of our little sweet universe has dropped to the point where the protons and the neutrons can combine now to form an atomic nucleus, such as helium-4. And then we had to sit down and wait really a long time, we had to wait 380,000 years for the electrons to finally form atoms together with our atomic nucleus. So the universe became suddenly transparent to light. And this was something amazing. And the light we still see today, and it makes up the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then, then, here we have it now. Suddenly we have a transparent universe and we see, finally we can see something. And then it took about 100 million years to 200 million years after the Big Bang that the first stars and maybe the first galaxies begin to form from clouds of gas. And this gas is primarily hydrogen and helium. Now, depending on the region you are brought up here on our little planet, your genesis might be a tiny little bit different from this, but hey, today we are talking about science. And then, after the stars formed, we had to wait for the first stars to die and explode. We were looking for the first supernovae to produce heavier elements. Because we needed something like, oh yeah, yes, it's happening, a star explodes. Imagine, isn't this beautiful? And this exploding stars creates here and pushes out into the universe the heavier elements that it generated burning through its different phases. So, oxygen. We found oxygen as far back as 13 billion years. 
So oxygen was created quite about 600, 700, 800 million years after the Big Bang, which is amazing if you think about it. And of course it was found in a region of interstellar dust called this here. And the dust is likely produced as the author of this astrophysical journal letter, publication say by the first supernovae. And suddenly we have heavier elements now in our universe. And you say, hey, wait a minute, if I have hydrogen and oxygen, there is a formula I remember from school, H2O. Yes, exactly. But we're in a completely different phase right now. So what we're looking for is, I told you we're looking for planets. And of course, there was a first planet that we as humans discovered. And this is the image of the first exoplanet mankind ever took. Here we have a beautiful star. This is a brown dwarf, what we call it. And here, this little red dot here, this is our first exoplanet with the beautiful name of 2M1207b. I told you, astrophysics, they are very creative in marketing. Yes, 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 you can read all the details about it, but we could have an image, we could see finally our first planet orbiting a different star. The instruments, of course, that this was recorded is what we call today a uh, in the Paranal Observatory, a VLT. I will show you a short information later on. Just that you know, this VLT consists of eight telescopes that work together. You have four unit telescopes with a mirror of 8.2 diameter each. And then you have four movable auxiliary telescope with a mirror of about 1.8 meter in diameter. And if they work together and there's a little bit of a supercomputer network be, uh, below them, you can use them as a giant interferometer for our observation of the universe. And here we are now in Chile Paranal Observatory, where our VLT observatory is located. And here we have them. Hey, wait a second here. One of the big mirrors, two, three, and four. So here you have them. And you know what I told you about the auxiliary movable mirrors? Here you have them. Number one, number two, number three, and number four. Aren't they cute? Oops, wait a second. Wrong. This was wrong. Oh uh, yeah, here we go. So those are all movable for interferometry objects where we get some magnificent pictures. And yeah, this is a webcam. This was recorded on April 25th, 2023. This is the night sky in Chile recorded with a webcam if you are working at an astronomy lab. So here you can see these are our four main telescopes that we have. And our four little ones here that are movable. This is here where all the discoveries are going to happen. And you see here, I mean, look at the night sky. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, I think this is our Milky Way on the Southern Hemisphere. Unbelievable. Unbelievable beautiful. So now you know the very large telescope, or as it's called, the Paranal Observatory or the VLT Observatory. Now let's have a look at the pictures that this beautiful combination of optical telescopes can take. So where are we today? NASA tells us in the Joint Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech tells us we have 5,000 plus exoplanets found in our galaxy, in our Milky Way. About four of them look like the Earth. 4% of them are terrestrial. 35% of them look like Neptune. 31% of them look like a super Earth in the size bit Earth, between Earth and Neptune. And about 30% are gas giants that we know like Saturn or Jupiter. So this is roughly what we could find here with some very simple techniques, just looking out at the universe with our telescopes. 
But you know what? There's an even more fascinating story in astrophysics because we can have a look how a planet is born in another solar system. And if you're astrophysics, you would reframe this uh, sentence here into we watch the complex processes within a protoplanetary disk around a young star. So let's have a look at this. There's here a beautiful uh, scientific publication I'll show you in a second. But this is when we watch out with our optical telescope and with our submillimeter and millimeter radio telescope, this is what we see. A star and its protoplanetary disk. A star and its protoplanetary disk. And this is such beautiful because you here, let's take this one here, you see immediately that here you have in the disk something like a gap. And you would assume that in this gap, a young planet is forming. We can watch the formation of this planet right now as it clears here in his orbit around the star, the gas and the dust out of its orbit. Now, this is, of course, a very non-scientific uh, way to see this because, hey, in astrophysics, it's all about mathematical formulas and understanding. So we have to have, of course, here a publication. And here we have it, University of Georgia, locating hidden exoplanets with a specific instrument, ALMA, I'll show you in a second, using machine learning. So you can see this is in November 2022. Machine learning is here a beautiful example now for the detection of new planets that are forming right now in our galaxy. And here you have here the lead author, this is Jason Terry and Cassandra Hall, assistant professor of computational astrophysics and principal investigator of the Exoplanet and Planet Formation Research Group at University of Georgia. <sighs> now we know for sure that we can use our AI technology to make brand new discoveries. Because they looked at the data and they looked at their model and they found out that they can use artificial intelligence models to find planets and find planets with an accuracy of higher than 99%. And I will show you this in a second. So, what is the instrument to use? And I told you, you have optical telescope and you have radio telescope. And this little fellows here are radio telescopes. And here we have the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array, a National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Isn't that beautiful? Now here you have all the details about one antenna, and you can see one antenna here, but the number of antennas on the whole area is 66 antennas. And this is beautiful. And you see here the dish sizes varies between 12 meter and 7 meters in diameter. So we have 54 12 meter and 12 7 meter arrays. And you can adjust them accordingly, whatever you want to investigate. You don't have to wait till the night comes on because we use here millimeter and submillimeter radio astronomy you can use the telescope 24 hours, 24 seven. And here now you see uh, how they look like in real time. Isn't this beautiful? If you want go there. And I think we even have a live webcam so that you see how it really looks there. Oh, here we are again. Okay. Here we have one dish. Ah, there are the other one. One, two, three, four, five. And as you can see, beautiful. Here we are. And there you have all the battery of our dishes for millimeter and sub millimeter observation. They are all connected underground, and you can make extreme precise radio images, so to speak from the universe. And as you see here, they are really now going further and further away to increase the resolution, different sizes. So this is an active area of research if you're interested 
to participate. And if you want to have a closer look at ALMA, there's this beautiful website, alma-telescope.japan. Have a look here, 10 things to understand about ALMA. It is beautiful. Tells you explore the unknown universe, the history of the universe, and the topic we're going to talk today about capturing details of planet forming regions. And here exactly you see the images you can get out of ALMA, how beautiful this is as a radio telescope. You can transform it here in visible data. We have a dust disk around a young star, another young star. So you see, you get an idea where you could expect that planets are currently formed. Isn't this beautiful? So here you have, you see here a star, and then all, it's a young system, a very young system, and the planets, so or one planet as we see here, is currently forming. So you see this here, he empties here the region of space where is his orbit, and this is what we believe today is how a planetary system forms here in this disk structure. But if you're looking for further topics, Alma has a very nice introduction about the ingredients of extraterrestrial life, what happens, radio waves to reel the cosmic structures, and you get the idea. Here you have an overall picture, how the antennas are located, how you can extend it, why we have to go to Gile. Global cooperations, unbelievable, great. Something about computer science. Yeah, here, for example, supercomputer, of course, we need to process the electrical signal coming from all the different antennas. Unbelievable IT is happening there. Yeah, and they have plans, of course, to grow, to make it more accessible and to pierce even more into the depth of space to the very beginning of our universe. So Alma now generates here with the supercomputer an image of a protoplanetary disk surrounding the young star with the beautiful name of HT something. You remember astrophysics and marketing? Yes, this goes hand in hand. And you see here this disk full of gas and dust. And it's a lot of gas. And now you might ask, hey, isn't this a fascinating environment also for molecules to form? for complex molecules to form. And you are exactly right. There is also a really complex theory about here all the formation processes that go on in this protoplanetary disk. So just to show you here from their scientific publication, spot the four protoplanets. In the middle, we have our stars. And then you see four dots. And those dots is what we think now, applying AI, the locations of four planets in this, if you want, star system. One, two, three, and four. And we can deduct their position using AI from the data from ALMA. This is really fascinating. Now, in order to understand how we can do this, we have to know a little bit more about physics. Now, in the protoplanetary disk that you think, well, it's a disk, there you can do some kinematic analysis of the gas and of the dust and of the complete structure. You know the mass, you know the velocity. There is a highly complex, purely physical mathematical model that evolved over, I don't know, 30, 40 years now. People thought about how can we predict what's happening here based on pure physical laws. There's no AI at the moment right now. And they have, let's call it instabilities that play in here. You have gravitational instabilities in the protoplanetary proto disk. You have vertical shear instabilities. The star has an extreme magnetosphere. You have magnetorotational instability effects that propagate through this disk. So you have a lot of different perturbations going to happen at different times in the evolution of this star that forms. So 
it is not at all trivial. But we have mathematical astrophysical models that we can program computationally and we call those models hydrodynamic simulation of young protoplanetary disks forming around stars. Beautiful. And then we have this simulation, and these simulations have a result. And the result is we print out whatever the system should look like. Because we observe the system, we get an image, so our simulations also present us an image. And then, and you're not going to believe this, we compare by our beautiful little eyes the simulation to the real observed data, left and right side, and we say, hey, this computer simulation, this looks good. And the other one, no, not at all. But you know what? This is exactly where machine learning comes in and offers a much faster, much cheaper, much more precise, much more accurate methodology. So we start with pure physics, have our models, mathematical models, do the computation. Those computation of hydrodynamic simulations give us a result. And it is that we compare this result with what we see. So you see, AI has not moved yet into the astrophysical dynamics within the protoplanetary disk, but it is at least at the doorsteps. If you want to know more about the, the mathematical models, I show you here Phantom, a smoothed particle hydrodynamics and magnetohydrodynamics code for astrophysicists. This is what you do for breakfast. If you're interested, hey, have a look at this, and you will be amazed about the complex physical and chemical interaction that can happen in a protoplanetary disk. And we use this simplified mathematical model here to do our calculations. And if you have now minimum or maximum values for the number of planets, the inner radius, outer radius, the mass, the mass ratio, the disk velocity, the surface density, Whatever you see here, you have here your system parameters from this particular study, and this is how the simulation works. Beautiful. Now, of course, if you observe here a star with the protoplanetary disk, it is beautiful beyond compare. Look, this is from Hubble Space Telescope. And here in the middle, you have our star. And this here is a very particular system. It is called macroscopy. And here this star is, of course, darkened. Otherwise, it would be too bright. But here where this little star symbol is, here is our main star. And this here is our disk where the planets form right now. You have in the background a galaxy. You have in the background of this picture taken a star. But look here. This is from 2010. This is 2011. And this is 2014. Hubble took very detailed photographs, plus one year, plus three year. And you could see here, and this here is exactly the window that Hubble looked at. You have here density variation that we believe to be planets. Planets forming actually right now in this year's and you see how it evolved, and we can really see today with our optical instruments here, in this disk here, how a planet forms. And this provides us here the ground truth for our AI system, because we can observe the real world, the real universe out there, and then we can build models that show exactly this dynamical behavior over time, give them a specific mass, give them a specific impulse, give them a specific density, give them specific characters, how this disk looks like, and we can compare it with the reality we observe. Hubble Space Telescope, again, VLT, a lot of instruments work together. Beautiful, beautiful science, unbelievable, the results we get out. So, yeah, my time, okay. I've heard a comment, yeah, but in those disks, you see the gap, no? You see this, this circle or elliptical gap. So, of course, there's a planet. Yeah, I know that this is, this is also what we expect. 
But you know, the point is to find exactly the location of the planet. Because if you have, let's say, a circle, where is it? In the north? Or is it south? Or is it here east? So where is the azimuthal location if you have north? If you go a certain degree, what is the azimuthal location of this planet? So where is it exactly in this cloud of gas and dust? so that we can have its specific eff effects and compared with other planets in the cloud. So, beautiful physics. If you want to have a first step, you put your, your, your first feet into the water here, hydrodynamical simulations of protoplanetary disk, including irradiation of stellar photons, this here on one specific problem of the vertical shear instability, I would recommend you have a look at this publication. It is from October 2020. Uh, Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Germany gives you an excellent overview. And here you have, if you want, the HTTPS link to read it yourself. So you see then where we are today. And this is a visualization, what we see today. On all of this, you have a star in the middle and it's planetary, protoplanetary disk where the planets form right now. This is a star, this is a star, this is a star. And you see the variety that we see. And of course, if we look here top down, so we can see the whole protoplanetary disk. It is so beautiful. But of course, it can be angled. It can be edge on, as I showed you just before. So there are a lot of combinations where we can learn a lot about the internal dynamics. And we will talk about the chemistry a little bit later on. So you see here Alma, you see here Alma, Alma, you know now what we are talking about. So now it's time to jump into artificial intelligence. We look now at the AI model itself. And we have here, I don't know if you remember, January 2021, Ragnet. It was a self-regulated network for image classification, but you know it as an advanced model of a convolutional RNN. So this is really, uh, allow me to say, more than two years uh, ago. So this is really in the stone age of our actual transformer AI uh, century. And they used here a model with a 600 times 600 pixels times a channel image. And you're not going to believe this when you read it. And the output that they are looking for, the classification that they use this model for, for this image classification, uh, they have a two-component vector. Two, two-component vector. Well, of course, they use a softmax activation. And you have two classes. And they have a predicted probability that the input belongs to two classes. And the first one is contains at least one planet class and does not contain a planet class. So this is the, the simplest AI model we can think of that we just have a binary decision, yes or no, a planet, yes, a planet, no. And this is the models they use, and you might think, hey, my goodness. But yeah, this is, yes, astrophysics currently. So, And then they use an atom optimizer, what you know, we have our gradient scaling, we have the cross entropy loss. So everything, how we calculated those models two, three years ago in AI. And they use these models and it works and this is great and we get great results. But just to show you, today the astrophysics is not there where we are here, for example, when we know different models. And this is exactly what they say. They applied here this particular AI model that I just showed you here. And they get here that the model and they have multiple of their models here a planet with greater than 99% confidence, and they have their empirical observation and they confirmed this and it works, this is great. But they say, hey, they recognize we are right at the beginning. So for the future, applying maybe a full segmentation and an object detection method would further increase here the ability of our models to locate the planets and maybe get some idea about the internal parameters like a planetary mass. And they say, we leave this work for the future, but you see, if you are interested in artificial intelligence, and if you know a little bit about the current methodology, 
about the current vision technology that we use, the transformer-based AI that we use today. And you, you like astronomy or astrophysics or astrobiology, whatever you like, there is a, there is a need for AI scientists over there to implement the new model, to implement the latest technology. And yes, I have on my channel also here a video about vision transformer that you could use and it's much more advanced about image technology in 2023, mask former identification of each and every object in your image. And I have a whole YouTube playlist for vision transformer. But wherever you go and you inform yourself and you learn about this technology, I would say, hey, astrophysics needs help. <laughs> And of course, if you would like to learn more about the universe and about star formation and the very beginning at the universe, you are not going to believe now the main source I would recommend to you. And this is, of course, CERN. Yeah, we are talking about elementary particle physics. But if you go there, and this is their homepage, and you go here, understanding our universe, and I have here the HTTPS link for you, you have beautiful simulations and animations and videos about the universe, the very early universe, about dark matter, about cosmic rays, quark gluon plasma, what I talked to you at the very beginning here of this video, matter, antimatter, asymmetry, supersymmetry, mathematical models that we develop. So CERN has some beautiful videos if you feel that you like this topic, if you feel you might study astrophysics or physics or mathematics. There is a whole world waiting out there for you because we need people who are able to code AI to advance astrophysics right today on a lot of different topics. And I hope I've given you an idea how we use artificial intelligence today in order to detect new planets in our galaxy. Yes, and an outlook for the next video. So now that we have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and phosphorus atoms, now the next video is, of course, about the origin of life. What else would you expect? And how we use artificial intelligence whenever we look now at the DNA, whenever we have our four chemical bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, and I will show you how we can access the genetic information, how we can build specific proteins whenever we want to leave Earth and conquer the next planets. We're going to need a lot of molecular machines that work within our human cells. But this is the topic for one of the next videos. I say thank you. I hope you learned a little bit. I hope it was a little bit informative for you. And I see you in my next video.